name is Luca Belli. I am professor of internet law and regulation at FGV Law School, where I also head the Center for Technology and Society. And uh, I will moderate this workshop uh, for you. I, this workshop has been organized in partnership with Pan America, and our first panelist will be James Tugger, who is research director at Pan America. Then we will have Françoise Dossé, who is directress of the Centre d'études du monde russe, caucasien et centre européen uh, at the uh, École de haute études en sciences sociales, EHESS, in Paris. And then we will have, last but of course not least, uh, Anya Kovac, who is directress of the Internet Democracy Project India, and also our non-resident research fellow at uh, the CyberBricks project uh, hosted by FGV. So the reason why we have decided to organize this session about uh, digital sovereignty is that it is quite obvious that digital sovereignty is hitting the, the headlines uh, lately, but also it, it, also it is also quite obvious that it means very different things to different people and depending on the speaker and on the audience may trigger some very different uh, reactions. If it, the concept is used in Beijing, in Brussels or in Brasilia, the reaction may be very, very different. And while there is no question that all states enjoy uh, the sovereign right to uh, rule or in a specific territory and define rules for the people according to their constitutional frameworks that the people have chosen for, them, for themselves, it is very different story when we have, when we introduce the digital uh, uh, ecosystem into the discussion and it is very difficult to understand to what extent uh, the concepts that are more or less consolidated in international law international relations apply to the digital ecosystem and how they apply now the uh, the boundaries of uh, digital sovereignty are quite fuzzy precisely because the digital ecosystem and the internet in particular has a global uh, nature by design. So the, uh, there is no question that sovereign states have the right to apply their norms, their rules, but there are also some limits to how sovereign states can apply their norms and their rules. And there might be also some conflict of jurisdiction and also some uh, unintended consequences, some collateral effect or some, some negative externalities, to use a term that is more familiar to economists, that any kind of digital sovereignty initiative or policy may trigger. Now, the, uh, uh, for those of you who have a, law, a legal background, uh, lawyers know that uh, these questions are really not uh, recent. The uh, famous Yahoo versus France or uh, Yahoo versus Lika, to be more uh, precise, case was decided more than 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, over the past 20 years, there have been a lot of discussions about how to apply the sovereign state's right to uh, rule on uh, their people and the services that are accessible to their people without impinging upon other people's rights. And this is precisely what we want to discuss today. What are the, what is digital sovereignty and what are the limits to digital sovereignty and how we can uh, try to consider digital sovereignty for its content and not just as a uh, slogan, a, a quite void label. And uh, also how can we avoid a, a merely political use of the term of the label digital sovereignty? Now, you, for those of you who have followed this debate about digital sovereignty over the past uh, weeks or months, uh, it is clear that almost anything can be associated with digital sovereignty, but there are some macro trends, some macro categories that can be distilled, and we are trying to explore those macro trends in the uh, session of today. First, uh, we can uh, understand that it is quite easy and immediate to think about how 
data are regulated when we speak about digital sovereignty. So uh, the emphasis on personal data regulation or data regulation over the past months directly aims at tackle how data, how personal data of the people that live in your country can be used, how they can be hoovered by foreign companies and how they can be used to produce wealth ab ab abroad uh, and how to protect the privacy of your citizens. And so the, these have triggered a flurry of digital localizations initiative and a lot of proposal for data privacy regulation that of course aim on the one hand at protect individuals right and define uh, uh, rules of the road for businesses but can also be exploited for nationalistic and protectionist purpose. Another very important macro category is content regulation. So how speech can be regulated, what are the limits of speech on uh, uh, digital services? And of course, again, here we have very legitimate reasons like avoid and limit the spread of misinformation, avoid foreign meddling through uh, to, through the uh, uh, circulation of uh, so-called fake news. But of course, this is also a very uh, easy way to silence opponents and to over-regulate speech. And last but not least, uh, we have also digital sovereignty implemented through uh, infrastructure, through digital infrastructure. This is probably the most interesting, although the less debated, uh, macro category of digital sovereignty. There is already some very interesting research emerging on this, like the one that we are going to hear about from Francoise and her colleagues at the Resistic team. And uh, this is probably the, the Russian case is the most outspoken because Russia has proclaimed it's uh, not only a, a, has adopted a law on uh, internet sovereignty, but has really directly outspokenly said it wants to be able to disconnect it, the Russian segment of the internet from the global inter internet. Now, the extent to which this is really feasible, it's another story. And it is precisely one of the points we are going to discuss today. Now, having said, having set the scene and for you to understand how we will also organize the, the discussion today, uh, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to our first speaker, who will be James Stagger. James, you have been an excellent partner in the organization of this session. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Luca. Thanks for everyone for attending. Um, yeah, so as mentioned, my name is James Tager, and I, I should briefly introduce my organization, PEN America. We are a literary and free expression advocacy NGO and the American chapter of the larger PEN international movement. And uh, we are actually putting out a report on issues surrounding digital sovereignty next week. Um, and one of the things that sort of um, uh, compelled our interest in this issue was how the internet is to this day the world's greatest technological achievement in promoting the cross boundary flow of information. And so in putting together our report, we had two key concerns, uh, ensuring digital rights and ensuring the continued connective global power of the internet. And as Luca mentioned, we're at a time when calls for digital sovereignty are, are growing louder around the world and across the political spectrum from governments. And in major part as a response to the concern that governments need to offer people a shield against unaccountable corporate actors. And there are other concerns, partially as a response to the increasing preeminence of the digital realm, partially as governments, national security and police apparatuses become ever more interested in internet and communications technology and the powers it may offer them. Now, I think Luca's point about the fuzziness the conceptual fuzziness of digital sovereignty is, is really important and not just in an abstract way, but in a concrete sort of political way. It's a contested term with no clear definition. It's a term that's being employed in a variety of contexts with a variety of motion, uh, motivations and as the rationale for a, a wide array of regulation, cybersecurity, economic protectionism, digital privacy, da data protection, digital sovereignty over technology, digital sovereignty as government intervention in foundational internet protocols. These are all different ways that different actors may invoke the concept of digital sovereignty. And 
when it comes to digital sovereignty specifically, there's certain real dangers in that fuzziness. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that early articulations of digital sovereignty came from authoritarian regimes. Right? Let's look back at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is this uh, intergovernmental grouping that uh, for which China and Russia are sort of the major players. Um, in 2017, India and China, uh, India and Pakistan joined, but prior to that, it was China, Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. You know, one um, one uh, proposal they submitted to the UN General Assembly, uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, in 2011, was a new international code of conduct for information security, and they they called for an affirmation that the policy authority for internet related public issues is the sovereign right of states, which have rights and responsibilities for international internet related public policy issues. This was a code they proposed in 2011, it was not adopted. They proposed it again in 2015, it was not adopted. But that code also argued that quote, the rights and freedom to search for, acquire and disseminate information were predicated on complying with relevant national laws and reg regulations. That's my paraphrase of the quote I should make clear. You know, anyone who works with human rights law will know that that's a formulation that's incompatible with human rights law, right? It's the old game of, you know, what comes, what, what's preeminent over the other, human rights law over domestic regulations or domestic regulations over human rights law and standards, in which case these domestic regulations can explicitly contravene human rights law and standards. The code would have bound states to a pledge not to use the internet to, quote, interfere in the internal affairs of other states, which is really a, a digital corollary to the longstanding authoritarian rhetoric that human rights advocacy represents interference in their domestic affairs. Um, and more recently, it's that it's been more recently that democratic nations have adopted this term as, as a governance theory themselves. And the, the danger there is that the usage of the same term across such a wide variety of actors may provide a conceptual smokescreen for autocrats and authoritarians who are able to hide behind this ambiguity by portraying their portrayals as neutral and technocratic. We've seen this for years in the realm of cybersecurity, which by the way, is a realm that is increasingly sort of adopting um, this rhetoric, uh, you know, uh, authoritarian actors pushing for a more muscular definition of cybersecurity on the global stage, one that conveniently would give governments new powers, but these governments are able to hide behind the argument of, hey, who's against cybersecurity? This is neutral. This is technocratic. You know, this is not rights violative. This is just an attempt to technocratically solve some of the cybersecurity issues of the age, right? That's the conceptual smokescreen that they're able to put up. Um, you know, there's the same danger when it comes to digital sovereignty. And, and that's one of the reasons why it's important to have this discussion. You know, PEN America is not saying we, we endorse digital sovereignty as a, as a conceptual framework, but we're saying if, if countries, if um, analysts and academics and advocates are to pursue this, we need to do so in a very clear-eyed way. And we need to do so in a way that centers human rights considerations and human rights standards, right? Um, this is a, another reason why this conversation is particularly important is because the exact same regulation in two different national contexts may have very different effects, right? Take, uh, and I know we'll be talking more about this throughout this session, take data sovereignty or, or the concept of sort of data localization mandates. We know that the human rights implications of data localization vary wildly by jurisdiction. In a national jurisdiction with enshrined rule of law, with privacy guarantees, with protections for free speech, the possibilities for abuse are comparatively minimal. And I use the term comparatively minimal very deliberately. I'm not saying that the potential for such abuse is absent. I'm saying it's minimized, right? But I'm far less worried about data localization in, say, Sweden than I am in, say, Belarus, even if we were to be talking about the exact same digital regulation, because the national context that sort of undergirds that regulation would be very different. Um, you know, PEN America, is, we're an NGO, we're not affiliated with any government, but I do wanna kind of eat my humble pie here and acknowledge that a major impetus for this drive towards digital sovereignty has 
been a distrust of specifically American corporate or governmental hegemony over the internet space in specific ways. I'm thinking about the Snowden disclosures. I'm thinking about Cambridge Analytica. I'm thinking about the rise of surveillance capitalism and the rise of digital disinformation and the way in which a lot of these things have been tied to uh, companies that are headquartered in Silicon Valley, right? I think we're going to see a continued rise in the invocation of digital sovereignty as essentially an attempt to rebalance power between governments and international corporations, where we'll particularly see this play out, um, you know, is in the countries and places where analysts and academics have warned against a new digital colonialism. I think one of our concerns is in, there's an obvious need for new protections against transnational corporate abuse, but um, we know that the expansion of governmental power over these corporations doesn't necessarily translate into increased protections. I could give a series of examples and in our report uh, coming out next week, available for free, www.pen.org. Okay, I'll stop. Um, you know, I, there's several examples we, we use. However, conveniently for us, inconveniently for freedom of expression, Nigeria has provided us with a hyper recent example with its enforced shutdown of Twitter for essentially failing to toe the government line. Again, this for me is a really important, uh, an example of a really important dynamic, which is how the call for corporate accountability has to be explicitly predicated on human rights standards and guarantees. Um, I'm already running out of time, so I'll, I'll move quickly to, um, uh, a couple of key takeaways. I mean, this all exemplifies the importance of insisting that any country's framework for digital sovereignty needs to be predicated on respect for human rights, including a broader system, which not necessarily any digital regulation will get to, but a broader system of privacy and free speech guarantees, rule of law and an independent judiciary. Put quite simply, you can't have a great digital regulatory policy and put it in a national context without these protections and assume you'll have a rights respecting framework. Our report discusses these issues in depth. I do wanna give credit where credit is due. Freedom House's 2020 report on user privacy or cyber sovereignty lays out a checklist for evaluating data localization measures specifically through the lens of the national context. And I, I encourage everyone to, to review it. So, um, What's to be done? Well, we have a few recommendations in our report and I'll just mention one quickly and then call it. But uh, one uh, recommendation that people such as Rebecca McKinnon, um, the former director of um, ranking Dig digital rights has come up with and that we replicate in our report is the idea that states should be adopting legal requirements to conduct human rights impact assessments on all internet regulatory proposals that pose a potential uh, impact on human rights. So that would include data storage, uh, proposals designed to regulate the conduct or activities of internet uh, corporations, and proposals that would affect the government's ability or authority to shut down or impede internet connectivity. I know I'm already at 10 minutes and I really look forward to the rest of our conversation. Thank you very much, uh, James, for, the, for uh, starting the discussion, uh, setting the scene and highlighting what are the main controversies actually that we are that we find ourselves analyzing. Uh, the fact that the fuzziness precisely of this concept allow for basically filling it with whatever initiative uh, one may want. It could be well-intentioned or can also be authoritarian initiatives. Uh, and all of them are under the same umbrella of digital sovereignty. So it's very, very important to uh, clarify what we are speaking about and also to analyze concrete example of what this could uh, lead to. And in this uh, case, I, uh, it's very good to have that we have uh, uh, Françoise Dulce with us today because she and her colleagues at Resistic have just uh, released a very interesting special issue on, um, on infrastructure embedded control, uh, analyzing the case of Russia uh, which is uh, a very interesting analysis of how actually a study of how these uh, measures uh, advocating for uh, internet uh, sovereignty can uh, play out concretely, which is actually the, the main question. Uh, everyone agrees that digital sovereignty could have good, uh, good uh, uh, results and could allow to rebalance the very uneven playing field between uh, gigantic corporations that has uh, James highlighted are usually based in Silicon Valley and the rest of the world. 
But then what happens when uh, digital sovereignty policies and initiatives are put in, 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 in uh, place? Now, uh, let me give the floor to Francoise to have uh, some more insight on this. And I would also like, I like to ask James to, uh, to disactivate the mic so that please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Luca. Thank you for inviting me to join this uh, session. I will try to share my screen and uh, I will uh, speak today. I hope it's okay. It's a problem here. Okay, so um, I will speak today of the Russian case, as uh, Luca uh, said, and uh, indeed I will present the a uh, special issue of this uh, journal, first Monday we published a month ago uh, with my colleague Francesca uh, Musiani and which was, which was devoted to infrastructure and embedded control, the convention on sovereignty in the Russian uh, internet. And on the slide, you have the, the list of colleagues who uh, published in this uh, issue. Uh, as you know, um, authorities in the Russian Federation are establishing in increasingly stricter regulation on internet innovation and practices. And they try to implement the autonomization and the so-called sovereignization of their national internet, which is called in Russian the RUNET, since the early uh, 2010s. And uh, in the... Uh, with the, the team of the Resistic Project, which is a project about criticism and circumvention of digital borders in Russia. It's a, a project we developed in, uh, in France for the light, late uh, three years. We try to analyze how different actors of the RUNET resist and adapt to the recent wave of authoritarian and centralizing regulations, uh, especially in Russia. And for my short presentation today, I will give you uh, first uh, some information about what is sovereignization in uh, Russia today. I will then insist on the multifaceted enforcement of these uh, policies of sovereignization. I will uh, speak briefly about resistant, resistance, escapism, and circumventions. And I will try, if I have time, to give you two uh, very concrete uh, example case studies uh, about uh, Telegram and uh, Yandex. So, uh, as you probably know, in uh, Russia, we observe growing uh, authoritarianism uh, practices, which raises the question of the repressive, repressive uses of the web uh, as elsewhere in the modern world. Russian authorities move towards the sovereignization of the RUNET through the adoption of new laws to counter foreign influences on the so-called agents or foreign agents. And these restrictions combine elements of security, so they are justified, justified by the fight against terrorism and extremism, by economic uh, re reasons like copyright, industrial espionage, opposition to web multinationals, and but they also implicitly have political consequences. And this is uh, one of the main problems the, on the Russian internet today. The sovereign internet law was adopted uh, two years ago with the official aim of protecting the country from cyber attacks. And a law, which is called a law against Apple, was passed last year with the objective of having all smartphone devices in Russia to preload a host of Russian-made applications. And this policy of refocusing the RUNET nationally has been clearly documented by researchers these last years. But what is, uh, concretely, this policy of uh, sovereignization this in, uh, in Russia today? And I wanted to insist on the multifaceted enforcement of these laws. I have also to remember you that uh, after the demise of the USSR, the brutal political and economic transformation of the 90s led to a decentralized and complex development of computational and digital infrastructures. And what is uh, striking today is that the Russian digital environment is very heterogeneous, characterized by the coexistence of international actors like uh, Google, Facebook, Twitter, the so-called GAFA, and national actors who are uh, very strong, like Yandex, Contact, or Ozone, for example. 
And uh, the control policy of the Russian state must not necessarily be seen as following a vertical, coherent, and hierarchical uh, model. The laws applying to online activities are very numerous. They are constantly uh, adapting. We have laws against terrorism, extremism, pornography, about data, and they are constantly changing, and their enforcement is often random or arbitrary. What we observe is that new instantiations of control are fleeting, invisible, changing, and multifaceted. The exercise of authority is often a discrete activity weaving many webs, playing with countless relationships that are hard to visualize. Control is exercised in the long term, exploiting the blind spots of the public arena and very often through infrastructures, which is not always visible for uh, ordinary people. But uh, we also observe some forms of resistance, escapism, and circumvention of these new uh, regulations and sovereign regulations. And if we understand, if we understand the diversity of constraints applying to the Russian web and internet, we can understand the many forms of resistance, escapism, and circumvention that have developed in reaction to them. The use of infrastructure is a way to indirectly by bypass constraints and coercion. And coercion sorry. A number of dynamic behaviors, which can be qualified as infrastructure-based resistance, have emerged in close response to uh, legislation. Understanding net resistance by focusing on the technical components of hardware and software, the continuously evolving infrastructure that populate the internet, which holds it together or fragments it, and, it, and is at times a test bed for internet governance uh, battles. And I wanted to give you today two examples. The first one is about uh, the Telegram ban, and the second one about the uh, Yandex controversy. So we observe infrastructure-based digital resi resistances which emerged these last years in, uh, in Russia. Uh, in 2018, uh, the Telegram ban was emblematic of the tensions that arise, arose between the governmental narrative of a sovereign internet and multiple infrastructure-based battles of resistance. Despite official decisions, because Russian authorities decided to ban uh, Telegram in Russia, internet users in the country managed to circumvent this ban uh, through a diverse set of digital resistance tactics, including obfuscation, circumvention protocols, proxies, virtual pri private networks, and uh, full-fledged acts. And they managed to access um, Telegram despite uh, the ban. So it was quite uh, emblematic of the situation in Russia. The second example is about the Yandex uh, case, the Yandex controversy. Yandex is the, um, uh, the, the main um, uh, search engine in, uh, in Russia, and it developed a news aggregator, which is called Yandex News, which is the Russian equivalent to Google, uh, uh, Google News, and it, had, it, has, it has been at the core of several controversies. The aggregator is a key asset in the Russian government's effort to assert digital sovereignty in the country by controlling uh, uh, news dissemination. However, this control uh, is drawing increasing criticism from media and digital specialists in Russia itself. And Telegram founder who, with uh, Pavel Durov plans to develop now an alternative news aggregator. So it's, it's interesting to see how this question of uh, aggregation became a political question in Russia. For my conclusion, uh, I wanted to underline that it's important to develop a critical approach to digital sovereignty to to have a nuanced and complex understanding of the specificities of internet governance in different countries and in their context. Uh, in Russia, Russian sovereignization policies are often described as a strictly vertical, centralized, efficient information control system. But by focusing on techniques of circumvention at different levels, we show also how the discourse on internet sovereignty paradoxically open up technical and legal opportunities for resistances and the existence of parallel uh, units. And this will be my last uh, slide. If you 
want to go further and to go together further, uh, we will organize a, an international conference on these questions, a criticism and the convention of conference surveillance on the internet in Paris next year. And the call for paper is open till September. So if you want to take part, you're welcome, of course. And uh, thank you so much. Merci pour votre attention. Thank you very much, Francoise. And yes, uh, you are all welcome to participate also in this conference where the debate will be uh, further expanded. And also, uh, if um, as this has been already raised by both James and Francoise, the uh, overlap somehow between cybersecurity and uh, digital sovereignty, I would also like to uh, invite all the participants to check the volume that we have just released on cybersecurity regulations in the BRICS, uh, where uh, many of these uh, these issues are also tackled uh, in the context of the BRICS countries, so Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And uh, what actually emerges both from uh, the presentation of Francois and also from, from some of the studies that we have conducted in this cyber BRICS project that uh, uh, allowed us to produce this volume is that it is not really easy to uh, implement this kind of infrastructure based measures. And even when countries are very keen on creating a, in, a, a national intranet separated from the rest of the world, uh, it is, and maybe to mimic a little bit the example of China that uh, since the very beginning has created a, a uh, so called uh, uh, Great Firewall of China. Uh, separating de facto the national internet from the rest of the world, uh, it is not easy to do it if you do if you haven't done it from the very beginning. So the situation of, and what also Francois pointed out very skillfully is that the, uh, even if you implement these measures, there, is, there are many attempts, that usually are successful to circumvent such measures. And so it is very different, it is very different when you create your digital ecosystem uh, by default and by design as a separated one, then when you create, when you allow to have a, an open internet, and then at some point decide to impose digital borders on, on it, it's very, it's much harder to implement this kind of control. And uh, now speaking about uh, the, the the research we have been developing within within the BRICS countries, I think is the best possible uh, uh, introduction uh, for to have now. Anya Kovac, who has not only been one of our stellar uh, CyberBix fellow, but also she has been leading uh, discussions on cybersecurity, uh, digital policies, human rights in India for uh, the past decades or so. And so, uh, Anya, you have also published a very interesting paper on data sovereignty in India very uh, recently, and uh, we really look forward to hear more about uh, the Indian situation with regard to uh, digital sovereignty and data sovereignty. Is Anya, the floor is yours. Thank you, Luca. And uh, yes, you are right. I'm going to focus specifically on the piece around data sovereignty, drawing on a paper that uh, I published together with my then colleague Nayantara Ranganathan uh, in 2019, actually. Um, I work with the Internet Democracy Project, and uh, our work is basically situated at the intersection, or it's a feminist approach to internet and human rights question. And so our take on the whole data sovereignty uh, debate also very much comes from those kind of feminist concerns, and specifically from what debates around sovereignty actually do to marginalized people uh, in particular. Um, our overall argument is actually very similar to the points that uh, Francoise and James have been making, which is that you really need to be nuanced about how you use this and analyze on a case by case basis what this actually means. But what I guess I want to highlight here is that that's not just a question we should ask when it comes to authoritarian countries. Our analysis in the paper finds that even in India, even if it is a democratic country, we see that data sovereignty claims actually, first of all, facilitate greater control over the people by the state and by specific uh, 
uh, powerful domestic private actors, but for the people themselves, sovereignty and with that, these uh, imaginations of greater autonomy and greater freedom really continues to remain a dream. And that is the notion of sovereignty that we really want to continue to hang on to, right? Um, I think in the interest of time though, what I want to present here really is the broader framework, the theoretical framework that we use to do our analysis to come to that conclusion. And maybe in that way to put a little bit meat, more meat on the bones of like, what questions do you ask? Because I think just a human rights approach often leaves us skimming the surface still a little bit too much. And the two concepts that we have worked with specifically um, in our paper were on the one hand, the debate around data colonialism, and on the other hand, uh, shifting the conceptualization of data from a resource to actually something that is embodied and therefore an extension of our bodies. And in that way, putting people back into the debate. And in a way, these two intermingle. When it comes to data colonialism, it's a really important framework in a country like India because data sovereignty is often put forward explicitly as a response to data colonialism. And we've drawn quite heavily on the work of um, Nick Coldry and uh, uh, Ulysses Michaels, who were actually in another session here yesterday, who have drawn parallels between data colonialism and historical colonialism. And two are particularly important for our analysis. One is the naturalization of dispossession through data as a resource. Dominant discourses of data construct data today as a resource, as something, something that's simply out there, that's up for, grab, uh, for grabs. But as a range of authors have pointed out, actually that naturalizes the collection of data in a way that's really quite similar to how colonial powers used uh, terra nullius or no man's land doctrines to talk about lands far away that were actually clearly uh, inhabited by other people. And by constructing those lands in that manner, there was no legal intervention needed. Their uh, exploitation could happen without any intervention. So the data as a resource construct actually does something very similar. At the Internet Democracy Project, we have been uh, building a body of work that shows that actually the erasure of a connection between data and people's bodies is at the heart of this move. Even the most intimate parts of our lives and experiences are now subject to datafication. And as that is happening, really a fundamental shift is taking place. The distinction between our physical bodies and our data bodies really is becoming irrelevant because so many decisions are made based on our data that impact us fundamentally in a very material way. And so this is not just saying that data bodies are also bodies. This is saying that our bodies, the definition of our bodies is undergoing a fundamental paradigm shift. And once you can see that, um, then you can also see that this has far reaching consequences. Um, you will actually start to think about protection of data in a different matter because it also starts to in include, for example, a need to think about bodily integrity when you speak about data, etc. So this whole construction of data as a resource, what it erases and what it does to people is one really crucial part of the uh, historical links with colonial, colonialism. Um, because in colonialism, in a way, not just the lands, but also the bodies of the people were er erased, right? Um, and slavery is another institution that really drew on dehumanizing a human being to be able to exploit them in ways that were then supposedly legitimate all of a sudden. I'm not saying that datafication and slavery are of the same order, but I do think there are certain uh, parallels in constructions around this. Um, the second really important uh, evolution that's happening is the redefinition of social relationships. For this data to exist and for its capture to become possible, the flow of everyday life has to be 
organized, configured, presented in such a way that it becomes possible to capture that data. This is why everything is moving on to platforms, right? But with that comes also a redefinition of our social relations that makes it seem natural that our data is dispossessed by our government, Facebook, whatever platform you're thinking of. This is a second really important parable. And so at a fundamental level, when you think about sovereignty as something that should serve the people, any challenge to data colonialism today to be effective has to actually challenge these underlying realities, these two pillars on which data colonialism is based. If we do not undermine those, a shift to sovereignty through this reclaiming under national law, uh, uh, even in democracies, it's fundamentally not possible. Maybe let me very briefly mention how this plays out in India. Also in our paper, we go into detail on how, for example, concepts like data localization, but also really flimsy conceptions of community data really are used to actually do precisely this, to legitimize the reconfiguration of social relations through this datafication and to, in that way, legitimize a data grab in such a way that transfer of control happens to our own state and uh, our own capitalists, which I think are not necessarily better as those outside. The notion of data as a resource is really uh, crucial to this conceptualization. But I also want to say that in the context of a country like India, I don't think that is necessarily, it's not ill will. Data is seen as a resource or conceptualized in most of the world. And actually what has happened is in India, seeing the particular economic context in which we live, there is a big market, there is a possibility here to capitalize on this if data is indeed a resource. There is also a great economic argument to be made in terms of the growth that can be achieved. So what India has done is really just take to its logical conclusion in the Indian context, what it means if you look at data as a resource. And so what we see is that government proposals, uh, policies, draft laws are very strongly emphasizing the economic value of, of data, even to such an extent that it is seen as a national asset, these are that's quoted in policy papers, that the government holds in trust for the economic growth and benefit of, of the nation. And frameworks like data protection then are imagined really as models that legitimize and regulate such attraction, uh, extraction, uh, put a framework in place for big business to, to do this, rather than actually protecting against it. Um, so in, in short, what we see then is really a transfer of power to domestic elites. And I think if we want to make the notion of sovereignty in the digital age substantive in democratic countries as well, we really need to take our analysis to a deeper level and ask more questions about those underlying, underlying rationalities also. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hania, for the excellent presentation. And indeed, you raise some very interesting points that I think are essential to have a critical approach to digital sovereignty. Uh, on the one hand, the fact that and this is a very shared concern that we have also within the BRICS uh, countries and the studies on the BRICS countries, the fact that countries that have very uh, large populations also are the main producers of digital of personal data, if we want to consider this as a resource, and some people like the prestigious economist uh, journal, which is not really the, the voice of the Kremlin, consider it the most uh, valuable asset in the world, then you have, you know that you are pr the producer of the most valuable asset in the world. And if you are home of 42% of the world's population, you have an incredible incentive to try to not allow others to extract it. And this really resonates very well with countries that have been former colonists and where extractivist economies is still underway now as a heritage of the former uh, colonial period. On the other hand, uh, what are we aiming at? Not being 
uh, exploited and controlled by foreigners in order to be exploited and controlled by a domestic actor. But this is not really the most uh, uh, advisable strategy. And here is where the, 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 the debate that you are very interesting, uh, uh, interestingly uh, uh, sharing with us today, but also spearheading about uh, data as bodies, and also uh, all the feminist studies and, and the Donna Haraway cyber manifesto and all these feminist studies that are fascinating to have a different perspective on what we are doing and try to approach it in a different way. So thank you very much for this. And then having uh, said, uh, having uh, provided this very interesting and fascinating multidimensional approach that to cyber, uh, to digital sovereignty, I would like to open the floor for questions. Uh, we have had very uh, already a couple of requests to share links of material. Uh, we are uh, we are sharing it both on Twitter and here uh, in the chat. The fir very first question with which I would like to open the debate is uh, well on, on your in your perspective, what are the key goals of digital sovereignty initiatives as diverse as may they could be, and what are the collateral effects? that one may foresee very likely will happen. So with this, I let me open uh, the floor and then well, let me also add another question that we have just received so that we ha you have time to think about the first one, which is what kind of initiatives you consider to be a digital sovereignty framework respectful of human rights, which this is also a very an interesting one. So on one hand, what is happening and what are the side effects? On the other hand, what could be initiatives that indeed respect human rights and try to challenge, avoid digital colonialism. Please, the floor is yours. I think you see James raising hands, so please let's, let's keep with the previous order. James, the floor is yours. Well, I, I'd like to, to take on the, the second prong of the first question, which will probably relate to everything that was asked, the, the collateral effects, because that, that I think or at least the way I interpret the question um, gets us into some of the thorniest issues. And it's something I was trying to get to when I was talking about the fact that the exact same law or digital regulation when implemented in different um, national contexts could have very different effects. I mean, um, uh, something we talk about in the report, and I think something that a lot of people have been following is that the European Union is sort of at least implicitly, perhaps expl I would say explicitly, holding themselves out as sort of this model of digital sovereignty that they want others to adopt, right? If you look at, um, I think it was Macron's speech at the Internet Governance Forum in 2018, followed by Merkel's speech at the Internet Governance Forum in 2019, both of them, Macron argued for this third way of digital regulation. Merkel argued that, you know, uh, when we say digital sovereignty, we don't mean protectionism, we don't mean censorship. She, she had less information about what they actually do mean, but there was an attempt to sort of explicitly de delineate a certain model of digital sovereignty. But again, the idea that if you take one concept of digital sovereignty or one specific regulation and, and implement it elsewhere, you'll have dramatically different effects. You look at the GDPR, in the European Union and you look at, I believe, Article 27, which requires a data compliance officer to be within the European Union, you know, as a way of establishing um, legal jurisdiction over transnational uh, corporations, right? If you take that same idea that there should be a local officer in the national jurisdiction at issue and you put it in places like, say, Turkey, um, you know, you have really violative rights effect. I mean, Turkey, I'm not saying as a, as a hypothetical example, I'm saying as an actual example, um, you know, in October of 2020, the Turkish government implemented a set of amendments to its social media law, implementing new data localization measures and uh, personnel localization measures, right, requiring Turkish citizens to serve as legal representatives within the country. These representatives could be charged with, you uh, uh, they'd be charged with resolving the content removal demands or the company would face heavy fines. And um, in, the con in the conversations we've been having in preparing this report, we've uh, heard the term, um, the hostage model of digital regulation. 
the idea that essentially, you know, these people could be um, used as bargaining chips between the company and um, the, the government at issue, right? I doubt that this was something that was envisioned um, by the framers of the GDPR uh, to, to the extent they, they envisioned it, but it's a, it's a representation of how, uh, you know, the movement for corporate accountability, the, the tools that governments have are inherently sort of, um, are inherently ripe for abuse, right? That's an example in my mind of collateral effects, right? The idea that any, um, really, really here I'm thinking of the European Union, but any government or regional bloc that's attempting to offer a vision of how it thinks digital regulatory governance should be run, um, you know, has this unenviable task, I would say, uh, but it, I think this is where we need to go of sort of imagining how the same law could be implemented in contexts that don't have the same sort of democratic or rights to respect and protections. This is, to me, is one of the thorniest issues when we talk about how to even have a, a rights respecting model of digital sovereignty. And, and these are the collateral effects I think we need to consider. James, I see Francois was going to add something. Please go, Francois. Yeah, thank you so much for the discussion. <clears throat> it's absolutely uh, fascinating to discuss this question of critical approach to uh, digital sovereignty. And uh, listening to Anya, I was struck by the different of imaginaries which are used in different contexts. I mean that you spoke about the history of colonialism, of course, and in analyzing the uh, contemporary situation, but the imaginary mobilized in the Russian case is the imaginary of the Cold War. So we are more in the Cold War uh, conception of these new uh, competition in the digital sphere than in the idea of colonialism. Of colonialism. But mobilizing the, the, the argument of the Cold War, uh, Russia doesn't, um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an imaginary of the Cold War without the Marxist or the socialist ideas, which were uh, at that time uh, supported uh, by the USSR. I mean that the, the idea here is that indeed it's a, it's a war uh, with foreign agents, with the competition with the American uh, domination in the digital sphere, but there is not so much interest in what is uh, equality or um, yes, social uh, equalities in, in, in contemporary uh, society. So in the Russian case, what we observe is that um, Russian elites too, and Russian big business, try also to, con to control the main uh, actors, the main digital actors in the country. And what you said about uh, the, um, uh, the big market in India, yes, of, uh, the, of digital technologies, we can observe more or less the same phenomenon in Russia. I mean that we have different imaginaries, colonialism and Cold War, but what we observe as a consequence is probably the same uh, domination of uh, economic uh, uh, digital business by elites. Uh, uh, that's what we, we, we can see in Russia. And what is interesting in the Russian case is, is that because of this situation, uh, opponents, uh, who try to escape uh, state surveillance and state control, uh, what do they do? They, they use mostly uh, American applications and uh, they, 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 they are more confident in Google's or uh, Twitter or Facebook um, services than in national, uh, in national services. So this is also one of the paradox we observe in the Russian case. Anya also had, has something to add on this. Please, Anya, go ahead. If there are not further questions, otherwise I can wait. We have another question that uh, just arrived. So which do you think is the right strategy when it comes to governments pushing back data sovereignty ideas or being a data sovereignty human, human rights respectful respectful, sorry, concepts that we can enforce. So this is a very tricky question, right? Uh, and uh, please, Anya, as you were looking for uh, new questions, here is an easy one for you. <laughs> oh, what did I do to myself? Uh, <laughs> I think uh, 
it's hard to um you can't simply say i think we're at a really difficult time in history right but you also see that there are these movements up and down and i think even like just in i have been working on tech policy for about 13 years now and i think in these 13 years things have shifted so much stances like i was wondering when james was talking in the early 2010s when that whole debate about who's go going to govern the internet was so strong all the Western governments were all into multi-stakeholderism and any talk, any mention of sovereignty was completely off the table. And then that debate was settled in the way that uh, developed countries wanted it to be settled. Uh, there were deeper questions to be addressed, but we never got there because that part was done in 2015. Then we were done and over with. And after that, now all of a sudden, they're starting to talk about national regulations, et cetera, in ways that were just not acceptable earlier. I think it's important to look at a larger context. So in India, I'm not going to say we have to forget about sovereignty. That would be, uh, I think, an irresponsible argument to make. But obviously, we will always put on to the table at the same time the question, how is this benefiting the people? And it's true, depending on the government, the priorities, also the larger landscape, the priorities from other stakeholders, finding these ways in is sometimes really, really hard. But so, for example, in our case, we when we um, um, present the body as data framework, it's so far removed from how the Indian government conceptualizes its work that it's not always an easy conversation. But one easy way in, in India, which a lot of people understand is to give the example, including men for that matter, is to give the example of when women or transgender people are uh, the victim of the non-consensual sharing of sexual images, they do generally not experience that harm in terms of a data protection violation. The way victims describe that harm is much closer to sexual assault. And there is even a court in India that has recognized this uh, in a case of so-called revenge porn, recognizing that this harm goes way beyond what our law actually allows us to address it as at the moment. And this is a very clear gap in people's experiences that exists because we talk about data as a resource. It is a harm that people can relate to and that we cannot even talk about as long as we don't start to reconceptualize data differently. So this also links into the previous question actually about like what are initiatives that lead to respect? I think like the GDPR, for example, is a good way forward, but it still doesn't fundamentally question how we think about data. And I really think we need this really big shift to actually be able to get to a point where we will have fully rights respecting legislation across the world. So in my take, we are now at a point where in 50 years time, we're gonna look back at this point in time and say like, oh my God, what were they thinking and doing then? They thought that was rights respecting. It's just really hard when you're in the middle of all of these evolutions and shifts to see everything that is going on, right? Maybe very briefly, one last point. I do think there are uh, very positive ways forward also that are maybe easier to use in, for example, strong examples of community data. And again, like yesterday, uh, Jeff Doctor was in another session who is from an ind indigenous community in Canada and shared resources about how they are trying to reclaim sovereignty also digitally in terms of data, et cetera. And I think from initiatives like that, these groups, these communities, they're very strong ideas about things that are already being implemented, about how we could try and shift some of this today in ways that might resonate also with our governments, but take into account the needs of the people at a much more fundamental level. Thank you very much, uh, Anya. And as we only have one minute left, uh, I think this would uh, this uh, optimistic uh, uh, handing, ending is probably the best way to conclude this session. There are a lot of challenges ahead, but already some very good examples of how things can evolve in a positive direction. A lot of research that has going already been developed and will be developed and presented in the upcoming months of e or year. And so stay tuned.
and uh, we have already shared many of the links to the publications that uh, participants requested on Twitter and on other social media. So stay tuned and please reach out if you have any other questions. Thank you very much to all the excellent speakers and thank you very much for the excellent question we had today. Enjoy RightsCon.